Welcome Hi. to BizLib Happy Hour. This is the show where we make your data relatable. And today's special, we've got, this is part one of a multi-episode series called Let Your Data Do the Talking. And I'm doing it with my co-host here, Emily Klein. Hi, Emily. Hi, Jean. Thanks hey, for having so, me. <laughs> oh, no problem. Um, it is happy hour. So are you drinking anything? Yes, I've got two varieties of water with me today. Ooh, one what plain, is that? One sparkling. Sparkling. Is it flavored? <laughs> Orange today. People who watch the show know we're a big fan of flavored sparkling water. Yeah. It's great for drinking... the noon at the hours too. It <laughs> <laughs> it's my it's my afternoon, but I'm having orange Gina. It's it's like Ooh. orange juice. It's like sparkling orange juice, but it's in a wine glass to be more happy hour yeah. on theme. Yeah, what are you guys drinking at your desks? We're interested to know. Are you guys having a nice little alcoholic beverage? We're just keeping it nice and clean today. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so today we're gonna talk about data literacy. We have a whole multi series about data literacy. So um, I'm curious to hear what, what, what do you think data literacy is? Yeah, um, to me, I feel like data literacy is kind of ingrained in our society now, in, in our work culture. Um, working in engineering, I was always surprised to see how, you know, a group of engineers, many with like advanced degrees, just don't know how to communicate with data. Um, and so coming out of the um, engineering industry into the world of data analytics, um, I've just been so passionate about finding ways to make data relatable, um, ways for people to see data as, you know, just like reading a book, um, a way to communicate information. And um, so I'm excited to chat today and to share my passion um, for data storytelling. What about you? We have an interesting comment says data literacy is such a big buzzword in the recent years. Curious to see where they'll go with this. <laughs> I agree. I do. I think data literacy is all about having data be kind of legible in a sense, which is, which is almost, you know, it's very straightforward. But yeah, a lot of people, I find that they don't know how to read charts. They don't know how to read data. They don't know what's good and what's bad. And I think data literacy is just about making data clear and easily digestible to people. And um, we actually have a great guide um, by VizLib that our great marketing team has published. And um, it's a great guide to data literacy. It's like a how-to explaining what is, what helps you make data literate, what is helpful. So yes, please go. Um, we should have the link. We'll have the link up shortly. There it is. Yes, check it out if you want to learn more about data literacy. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great article. I found a lot of awesome nuggets um, and focus on the learning and development side too within that article. So definitely check it out. Awesome. And today we're diving into part one. And I'm curious to see what you have today. So let's yeah. dive right in. All right. Let's uh, share screens. And here we go. So um, I love talking about data. And so I've kind of titled this series, Let Your Data Do the Talking. I think that um, a lot of times we forget that our data can speak for itself. Um, so how can we empower our data to do that? Uh, you know, it's really surprising, like I mentioned kind of in this intro, we, we live in this world of data, but we often lack the ability to harness the power of that data and um, be able to communicate that clearly. So the goal of this series is just going to be to introduce data visualization, best practices, tips, um, and really get to talk about how to, um, you know, get to know your data, tell a compelling story with that data, and to develop and implement effective visualizations that are really going to empower our organizations to have data-driven decision-making um, complete. So this um, next few episodes of Appy Hour, I'm really excited to be a part of. Um, we're going to be just introducing that foundation, but I really think it's going to help you all to get right on, on the right track to let your data do the talking. So let's uh, dive right in with getting to know our data. I have a quick question. Is this a PowerPoint? Because this does not look like a PowerPoint format. Great question. This is a Click app. I developed a Click app using a lot of our um, 
you know, really neat features within VizLib. So some of these add-ons like um, our sheet menu to make it have more of a presentation feel, but I've got some data hidden in here that we're going to play with later. So um, yeah, and maybe we can make this available to others after our series is over. Okay, yeah, that's great. I bet people would be interested in playing around in here. Yeah. So um, let's start with our audience. Uh, this is a really important place for us to start, getting to uh, a place where we can just identify who we're talking to with our data. Um, we want to be as specific as possible when we're identifying our audience. It allows us to focus our visualizations really clearly on who we're going to be communicating with. Um, so we really want to just ask ourselves, who's the key decision maker and who cares about um, the results or the information that I'm going to be sharing? Um, some other questions or some other uh, tips here would be that we, we want to make sure we understand um, our relationship to the audience. Um, the, their perceptions really matter. Um, so if they are, you know, if we are unfamiliar with that audience and we need to build credibility with them, we may need to use a few more visualizations in order to, do, to build that credibility. Whereas if this is someone that we've worked with a lot and they really know our work and trust that we've done our background research, we can probably get that information across to them in one or two visualizations um, that can drive that impact that we're looking for. So considering our, our relationship um, with that audience member. And then we wanna remember that our, our narrow audience provides that focus for us. So, you know, a lot of times when we get to the, that blank paper, when we're starting to put some visualizations together, it can be a lot of scatterbrained ideas. And once we've narrowed down who it is that we're talking to, we can really focus in on what it is that's important to that audience. Um, we have a great question that came in saying, do you print out your reports? And um, yeah, I guess, I guess it is important to see what kind of format also we were going to show because that also matters and, you know, drill downs to not drill down. Yeah. And actually, we're going to talk about that in the how of our, our, our audience. How are we going to communicate with them? So I'm going to save that question for just a little bit. Okay. Thinking ahead. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah. So what is it that we want to communicate? Um, we want to identify an action. Um, we want to either inspire our audience, we want to persuade them, or we want them to take action on the data that we're presenting. So I really want to encourage you that if you can't identify that action that you want your audience to take, it's likely that we probably don't need to communicate this with data. Um, so really kind of think critically about what it is that you're communicating with data and consider what the action is. Um, that'll really help us to narrow down which visuals we're actually going to be using um, for, for our audience and the message that we want to communicate. A great way to figure this out would be to interview your key stakeholders, um, especially when you're building dashboards, talk to them, figure out what it is that's important to them. So in the chat, I'd love to hear what um, our audience set, uh, thinks what are some of the questions that you would ask during one of these interviews? One of my favorite questions to ask is to, to really ask my audience member, what, did it, what is it that they cannot answer today with data? That really helps me to identify what's the biggest gap? What's our gap in data communication? And how can I go fill that with you know, pieces of information from our, for our dashboard or for our, our um, report that we're building? Oh, that's interesting. We have Joe saying he likes to ask, what decisions do you make where data is necessary? Yeah, it's another that way to question. get to that point, too. Awesome. And we'll come back if, if any others um, chime in for the questions that they like to ask. Um, oh, we've got another, oh, another one. one. From Liron, uh, ask yourself, what is the first question you ask yourself in the morning? <laughs> oh, he's got a question <laughs> for us. <laughs> What time is it? Where am I? <laughs> what keeps you up at night? <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> yes. No, those are those are great ways to kind of get your organization thinking in that mindset of, you know, what's what's really bothersome? What are we trying to to figure out here? What do you We've got an, another great question. What do you recommend when talking to a stakeholder who doesn't understand their own data? 
I actually find that sometimes when people don't understand their own data, they tend to think about ways to create a dashboard without really knowing their data. So I love asking like, what do you want to know? You know, don't tell me what you want to see, but what do you want to know? And usually it helps pinpoint kind of the, the result they want to get instead of, you know, visually the result they want to get. Yeah, I find that it's really, it's, it's very difficult to, um, you know, jump straight to a dashboard or storytelling when an organization doesn't know and understand their own data. Um, mm -hmm. That to me is an opportunity for just a whole organization wide change related to data literacy. So how can we bring our organization along this journey of communicating with data while we're also maybe building a stake, a, a dashboard for the stakeholder. Um, so that's a really great question. I think that it, it requires a lot of effort on that change management side where we educate our audience, educate our stakeholders on data literacy and, and working with their data um, so that when they are trying to make decisions from that data, they, they know what their, um, you know, the background is, the context, which we're going to get to later too. Ooh, Joe has thoughts on making data fun or dashboards fun. Ooh, I think he's reading our minds and kind of getting ahead of the game, isn't he? <laughs> I think so. Uh, making our dashboards fun, you know, I've, I've been a part of organizations in the past that are very rigid and, uh, you know, there, there's not much fun when it's related to data. But I think there's even ways that in that rigid, rigid structure, you can bring um, life to your data. <laughs> and so let's let's definitely keep keep that in mind as we're going through the rest of our chat today. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> All right. Um, so the last thing on our what, so, you know, we want to um, identify our action. We want to talk about, you know, talk with our audience, um, really get that interview going, learn from them what matters. We want to also identify our delivery method. So how are we delivering this visualization to them? Are we building a dashboard, an interactive dashboard? Are we um, going to present during a meeting so we have the ability to vote vocalize and share um, a visual? Or is it a written report? Is it an email? Um, a lot of times I really like to think this one through, especially if it's an email and it might get forwarded along to several others. It's like the telephone version, you know, when you're a kid and you play telephone and pass, pass some um, phrases around a room, you know, it, it can be misconstrued as it gets further and further down the chain. And so, um, you know, how, how do we maintain that clarity when we lose control of our visualizations? Um, and then lastly, just, you know, keeping that reception. So, you know, if, if we are losing control, if we're, you know, communicating over email, um, how do we make sure that we've got that the clearest focus we can have on our visuals? And we'll need to keep this in mind as we start to build out our story in, in the coming weeks. So let's jump into the how. Um, we want to identify the data. Um, obviously, we need data to tell a data story. So is our data coming from a survey, from a system, from, you know, training information? Is it, um, you know, automatically collected like sensor data? Or is it something that's manually collected in a field survey where somebody's writing things down on a, a clipboard? Um, so we really want to know that that aspect of our data, understand how it was brought together. Um, and we also want to examine our background and our context. Um, we want to uh, really understand the perspective that goes with our data story. And we're going to dive into this one a lot more in, in the next uh, next sheet here. So Jane, were there any other comments or, or um, interview questions that popped up while we were chatting? No, not yet, but uh, it's still, it's always open. We want to know what you like yeah. to ask your audience or or uh, your stakeholder, you know, what you like to ask them to get to know what they want so you can design a better dashboard. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about the context of our data. So Jane, I'm going to ask you uh, while we ask our audience as well, what do you see in this image when I pull this up on our screen? And what kind of conclusions do you start to draw just by looking at this image? Oh, that's a good one. I see, see a road Monday morning at 8 a.m. That's actually what I thought too, kind of maybe <laughs> people going to work. 
or I see a lot of taxis, so maybe it's after work and people are, you know, they've had like happy hour, their work's happy hour, and now they're coming home taking a lot of taxis. So you're starting to draw some conclusions. You're making assumptions about what time of day it is. Um, I didn't hear you make any assumptions about the location. Uh, so mm -hmm. if I told you this was a, you know, Wednesday morning in New York City, do we, ah, Joe thinks it's New York as well. It is yeah. New York City. <laughs> okay, so big cities make sense because it's very blocky. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What are the conclusions like? Now that we know a little bit more about this image, what what else could we maybe draw from from this? Um, then I might say it's not eight a.m. because I would assume eight a.m. New York would be even busier. So oh. maybe it's actually during sometime during the the day, midday or something. Okay, maybe or maybe during time. everybody's yeah. walking to lunch break. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe even COVID because there's less cars. Ah, that's a really good point. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that's so important as we're thinking about context is to really get into the details, understand our data from the full picture, not just the numbers on the, the page. Um, so we're understanding our background context. We, we may want to ask, what is the intended purpose of the data? Why was this data collected in the first place? Um, was it, uh, you know, when, when and where was that data collected? Was it before or after or during? Was it continuous? Um, so if I had, um, let's say I was collecting traffic data in New York City, um, was it collected throughout the day? Was it only collected during you know, the busiest times of the day? Um, was it before or after COVID? Was it during COVID? How would, how would that impact the way I tell my data story based off of the time of the year or, or the um, which year I'm looking at for the data? Um, how was the data collected? So like we were just talking about, was it survey data? Was it data that I can find um, reliable? Um, if it was maybe handwritten, I might find more room for error in that data and I might want to be cautious about the conclusions that I'm drawing. Or if it was collected from, you know, sensors or uh, surveys or, um, you know, image, imaging um, systems, all of that automation brings a little bit more, um, you know, rig rigidity into our data set and may provide, um, you know, more valuable data that we can tell stories with because we're not worried about um, that, that room for human error within our data set. Yeah, I would also say that maybe some biases are also really important when it comes to data collection. Yeah. And if anyone's interested in maybe coming in and, and talking about that, let us know. We'd love to explore more on data collection and anything surrounding data. That would be such an interesting topic to discuss. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I think that it's really important, like I said, if we're going to tell the full picture of our data store, we have to know the full picture um, that we're working with. So that's our, that's our context. And now if we just want to dive into knowing our data, we've got to um, just take a look at that picture of our data. Um, how do you, Jane, how, when you're just starting with getting to know your data, how do you get started when you're building an app or um, coming up with an idea for an app? How do, you, how do you get started? What do you put on the page? Oh my gosh, I always throw in a table and let me know if anyone else agrees with this. I love to throw in a table um, and kind of just explore things. Um, and then I actually always start with a bar chart for some reason. I always like the first thing I do is drag in a bar chart, whether or not it makes sense. I always go for a bar chart and then start and actually think and say, OK, what else do I want to show? Does a bar chart make the most sense? And I find that I can go anywhere from a very simple bar chart. Let me yeah. guess yours. Is it a pie chart? <laughs> no, I, I'm a, a table girl as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like to throw in a table and really like get to know what information I have available to me. And actually, I would say from a visual perspective, the scatter plot is my first go to. If I've got multiple measures, I'm always looking at, OK, what information am I seeing? Is there any conclusions that I'm going to be drawing from this data? Does it tell me anything? Um, so yeah, uh, as we're chatting through the the data that I've got on the screen, we'd love to hear from our audience too. What do you like to to put into your visuals first? Joe so, agrees with me. He also likes <laughs> bar charts, which is great. 
Yeah. Jackie likes the table. You see, there's a lot of more obscure charts that aren't getting much love, like the sand key. I don't know. But... That's a really a good first chart. <laughs> <change. laughs> it's like a really complicated part. pie chart, almost. Yeah. So when we're getting to know our data, um, some of the things that I like to take a look at once I throw in my table, um, just taking a look at the fields, what fields are available to me. And then I start to look within those um, elements, what data is within each of those fields. So um, in my title fields, I can see that I've got a full title. In my release date, I see I've got maybe a little bit different format of a date than I'm used to seeing. So maybe that's something that I want to clean up in the future. I do have a year field, so maybe I can kind of utilize that. But I do notice that my genres, I've got kind of a conglomeration of multiple genres in one field. And so looking at maybe splitting that out um, and, you know, being able to interpret my data differently based on that. Um, I also want to look for things like any missing data. Um, was the genre fill, field filled in for every single one of the movies that I've got in my Rotten Tomatoes data set? Or do I have all of the worldwide gross sales for every data or every um, title in my data set? Um, and then likewise, you know, just in that field of context. So how is Rotten Tomatoes data collected? You know, can anybody on the internet fill out the, the survey and, and rate um, a Rotten Tomatoes on Rotten Tomatoes? Or does it have any more validity than that? And maybe how is the IMDb rating different from Rotten Tomatoes? Or why are they, you know, not the same number? <laughs> Obviously, I think it's all opinion based, but getting into that and thinking through how does that impact the story that I'm going to be telling with this data? It is interesting. I don't actually know how Rotten Tomato and IMDb's are rated. So if anyone in the audience actually knows the difference, yeah, I'd love please, to let know. Us, <laughs> please let us know. I didn't actually research that before this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, I think some of some really fantastic ways to explore our data before you even start building visualizations are histograms and scatter plots. They help us to see, you know, What's, what's their data look like? Um, a histogram is going to show us kind of that concentration of data. So if I look at um, here, I'm looking at the length of each of my movies. So the time, um, or, you know, the, the length of, of the movie. And I guess that's in minutes. And so then that's the frequency in which um, that occurs within my data set. So I can see that most of my videos or my movies are between 115 and 133 minutes. Um, and then next most would be the 97 to 115 minute range. So that might be inf interesting information for me. Also the fact that I've got kind of a tail on the high end, but it really mm -hmm. drops off. Like nothing's really much shorter than 79 minutes. I don't know what's special about 79 minutes, but I've only got one movie that's shorter than that. I wonder what that one movie is that's extremely short. Oh, the short one? Let's find out. To Fly. Hmm, never heard it of was that movie. Released in 1976. <laughs> By the documentary. National Air and Space Museum. Hmm. So then this here is um, my scatter plot that I put in. I've got my um, worldwide gross. This is in millions of dollars and the freshness score. So, you know, I was asking myself, do movies that make a lot of money result in the highest ratings? So I, I kind of, I was like, oh, if I make more money, do I also get a higher score? And you can see I've got this slight positive slope, but my R squared is absolutely horrendous. <laughs> so, um, you know, a point that I wanted to make with this is how important our context is. So I haven't really told you much about this Rotten Tomatoes data set. I do not have every movie from 1975 to today. I've actually only got the top 10 movies from a worldwide gross perspective in this data set. Oh. So the so, data is already a little bit skewed because the data is skewed. So we don't want to, we, we got to be careful about the questions that we're asking of our data and the context of that data and how it was collected, 
you know, what information do we have? So um, this is a great example of why knowing the, the full context, the story behind our data is so important um, to being able to communicate a story with that data. Because I probably would have led a few people astray if I had, um, you know, come up with this nifty conclusion that it, mm -hmm. if you make more money, you get a better rating. <laughs> Don't go doing that. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what that movie is that the orangey red one. That's the, the outlier here? right here. Yeah. I think that is Avatar. Okay. Yeah. So very fresh, made a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. What about the top green one that is very fresh, but did not make too much money? This guy over here, we've got the Terminator. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another piece of information that would be interesting is like, do I account for inflation in my worldwide gross? Because this is quite a few years. Anyways, that's a whole nother ball game. <laughs> we have a question coming in. How to write back data to a database by using the write back table? And is there any sample script? Yes, uh, we've got, so we have, we've just chatted in a great little resource for you. Um, let us know if you can find the answer there. And if not, uh, we have a great support team, support at bizlib.com. Very willing to help out anytime. Yeah, great question. So Jane, I want to start diving into some real data that we can play with and apply some of these things that we just talked about. Um, so I know that you are thinking about a road trip coming up. Yes. Yeah, I've been planning this road trip for a while, but traveling's a little difficult and I'm already out of the country. So I thought I'll stay, I'll go back to the U S and then actually explore the U S because I find that a lot of Europeans have visited more of the U S than I have. So <laughs> I need to do a really good U S trip. So what do you think about making a, a data story to help you pick where you're going to go on your road trip? That would be great. That cool. would be lovely. Thank you. So let's let's just talk a little bit and and maybe figure out what Jane's story here should be. Um, so Jane, you're going to be my audience, and we're gonna I'm gonna try to design a dashboard for you. So tell me what is important to you when choosing a state to visit on your road trip. Ooh, that's a good question. I think if I go anywhere, I'd want to be visiting and being able to go around while feeling safe. So I think. Yeah, vaccination rates are really important to me, making sure, you know, like majority of people are vaccinated and just seeing which states I should go to that have very good vaccination rates. And also, um, I think that's important. Also, like the COVID cases are really important. Um, so, yeah, hoping that nothing's really closed down. And if cases are low, hopefully there's going to be less things closed. Uh, yeah, that's really important to me. All right. Um, how would you want to be able to maybe interact with this information? Do you want it to be like, I tell you where to go? Do you want to be able to play around with your data in any way? How do you, do you want to be able to um, filter, pick, choose, um, analyze in any way? I would love to be able to be able to play around with the data, um, but also easily come to a conclusion. So I don't want to have to really dive in really deep and do too much of my own thinking. Okay. I kind of want the data to do the thinking for me. Okay. And how far do you want to travel on your road trip? Oh, I mean, the US is my oyster. I'll go, I'll go to oh, any right. state. So it's, uh, yeah, totally. We're not limited. Totally, no, we're not. <laughs> All right. Um, I haven't been to the West Coast ever, so I think mm -hmm. I would love to go to the West Coast. That's very important to me. All right. So we'll keep that in mind as we're building up your data story. Yes. Okay. So we kind of got to know a little bit about what you're looking for. Um, now let's see what our data that I have um, is. So I've got some vaccine data here. I've by state and date. So we you know over time and in what location we've got some vaccination information, um, how many people are fully vaccinated in that state. Um, we've also got case information, um, the total cases, my confirmed cases, my new cases. I've got also some confirmed deaths in here. Would that be mm -hmm. interesting to you, Jane? 
Um, no, I, I think I care more about the vaccination rate and also the new cases that okay. are arising. All right. Well, so we've got more information maybe than we need to provide Jane in our story. So that'll be helpful as we start to kind of think about you know, what visuals we want to show to tell our story. Um, I've also got population information in here. So, you know, if we need to normalize any of our vaccination data, we could do that based off the population. We could also look at maybe, do you want to go to a densely populated state? I don't know. Is that important to Jane? <laughs> um, no, I mean, the population isn't important, but the vaccination by population would be important. That's fair. So That's fair. Yeah. I've got some fast food data in here. I think, you know, it would be really interesting to see how many fast food options you have for your road trip, like as you're traveling along and need to hop off the highway and get some food. Yeah, that might be interesting, but I will say it's maybe not a star of the show. Okay. Um, but yeah, that would be an interesting thing to have after I've made my decision, like it, within my decision to oh, kind of cool. maybe choose where I would want to go first. So I think you're telling me that you wouldn't make your decision based off of fast food, but it might be interesting information to help you plan your trip after you've made yes. that decision. Yeah. Okay. So we should definitely keep that in mind. You know, maybe there's information that we can provide you to help you make the decision, but then information that we can provide you for your trip planning itself. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, uh, yeah. Two different ways of looking at the data. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like COVID data is really the most important for you in making this decision. So let's talk a little bit about the context of our data. Um, do you remember any key events around COVID? Like when when did it lockdown start or when did the pandemic become a real thing? Like, do you, do you remember any of those key dates that we can um, kind of put on our timeline here? Oh, man, I think I remember March... Uh, 2020 being pretty important, but I don't know the exact date. But um, yeah, that would be interesting. And maybe when vaccination started rolling out would be really yeah. interesting. If anyone in the audience has this off the top of their head when the first vaccination rollout was, uh, that would be really good to know. Um, Some yeah, of the, those the dates that I thought of were, so March 11th, that's when the WHO declared the um, pandemic. Uh, and so that might be an interesting place to start our data set is on March 11th. Okay. Yes. Um, and then as far as vaccinations, I think uh, at the end of March of 2021, so about a year later, that's when, at least in the United States, which is the context of our data here, that's when um, states began to open the vaccine to a majority of adults. So that you know, it's not limiting the population based off of risk factors and things like that. Okay, th those are really important events that I would like to look at and see like maybe how fast the rollout is and okay. um, how well they're doing. So yeah, I would like to know, okay. yeah, looking at data from then and also maybe new cases after COVID has started because I wanna know about like how responsible the state is. Are they doing well? Are there, you know, just because, just because, you know, they're a big state, maybe they're doing really well with new cases. I, I don't know. Yeah, all great questions. I think that as we explore our data, um, you know, my favorite way to kind of go into that exploration is to ask those questions and start to pull up some visuals of the data and see if we can um, start to answer that. So um, the last thing I think we should just talk about really quick before we flip over to exploring our data, Jane, um, we, we might want to think about how this information was collected. Um, so this is coming from one of our, our U.S. Uh, medical sites, so we can, you know, trust our data source itself. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you think this information was collected at that, that source? Uh, that's matter? a good question. Yes, yeah. it does matter because I think maybe self-reporting wouldn't be as reliable if maybe all the vaccination collection was done, you know, every time someone got a vaccination every time they got a vaccine you know the data was imported directly that would be that would make me feel a lot more safer than if it was just based on self-reporting yeah I totally agree I think um you know thinking about a self you know reported versus 
uh, you know, some system that's in place for this reporting to happen. So maybe the administers of the vaccine are the ones reporting, I've given this dose, I've given that dose. And so collecting that, um, that data, I think that I, I also feel there's a lot more trust that I can place in that data set. So um, yeah, so as we start to explore our data, we can keep in mind that this wasn't self-reported data. This is information that's collected um, by our providers and so that we can maybe trust this information to help Jane decide where to go on her road trip. Awesome, sounds great. Cool. So let's explore our data. So like I said, this is a click act. So we can just kind of dive right in and edit our workbook and start throwing in some visuals. So um, I guess one of the first questions that I was thinking is how many cases and vaccines are there over time? So just kind of looking at a over time by state picture. What do you think of that? Uh, yeah, that I would want to know that just a general picture, just to see, you know, what's happening. And before we dive in too deep. So maybe a line chart, we could show a bunch of, you know, 50 states on one. Yeah, let's do it. 50 states on one. Let's see how <laughs> legible that will be. <laughs> the perks of filters, right? Yes, I I'm interested to see my home state, North Carolina, as well, and compare that with maybe a state I want to visit. Oh, let's go with confirmed cases. I feel like that's a really reliable data point. And I need to add in my date. Oh, we have a really good comment by... Uh, let me, am I saying this right? Uh, Yoshim or Yochem? Uh, cases are not that important when vaccinations are high. Uh, it's the number of hospitalizations that are more important. Oh, that's super interesting. Maybe for next week, we can add in a hospitalization data set. Yeah, that is. Thank you for letting us know. I don't know if this is going to be really helpful, Jane. We've got a lot of lines. Oh, oh my California. gosh peaks up here. Yeah. I wonder why California is so high. High population, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> great to know. It would be great to know, you know, the population versus confirmed cases then. Oh, man. Now we're asking new questions. So this is like, this is our cases. Is that green one, Illinois? You know, I think I have too many lines on my line chart. What do you think? Yes, I do. Yeah. I think 50 might have been a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> so actually one idea I have here, when we have a lot of dimensions that we want to look at. I think ridgeline plots are really great for this. So we can look at. Oh, yes. And this is actually quite new. And I say new. I think it's it's been released for about two months. But um, I think not many people know about it. The ridgeline plot is very interesting. And yes, uh, it's great for when you have too many lines on a line chart. But yet you still want to show um, data over time. Uh, yeah, a ridgeline plot is really great for this. There we go. So let me get rid of this one. I think this is too busy. So we've got here a ridge line that's showing us some of these states. I don't know how it's sorting them. Maybe sort by confirmed cases, bring our top ones up. Oh, there's that. Might be good one. to know. Is that North Carolina? Yeah. Did read my mind. Although I think that we've got too many overlapping still. So let's just look at a bookmark. I made a bookmark of our East Coast states so that maybe we could look at. 
Oh yeah, that would be great to have. And look at all the... So maybe I can, you know, as we explore our data, we can pre-populate a couple of regions for you to look at. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I think Midwest, I'm not as interested in going to, uh, but yeah, definitely West Coast is something I wanna explore. I have not gone anywhere close to the West Coast. Cool, so we've got a ridge line. We can start to see, looks like my dates. Right. Ah, so we have a great recommendation. Fix the sorting and the ridge line plot. Yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of sorting and we also don't have all of our data loading. We need to get our dates sorted. Good to see that cases are going down as as the dates go. Um, am I, I think that's Michigan. This is also, if anyone's joining in who's new, this is all US data. We're looking at US um, COVID rates right now. Um, it's not hospitalization, it's just confirmed cases. Uh, but we had a really great comment saying that hospitalization rates might be more important. So we'll definitely go look at that. And yeah, that's a great example of getting to know your data, seeing what is most important and looking at your audience. Um, I'm a 20 something year old person. So yeah, like hospitalization is more important than just getting COVID. Um, yeah, thank you for that suggestion. And if anyone has any other suggestions on maybe what we should look at or what Emily should ask me, uh, let me know. And yeah, if you have suggestions on where I should visit, let me know too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So we've got... Oh, try putting the state second. Liron has made a comment. Interesting. Liron's very helpful. I turned the sorting off on the state though. And people can watch us actually fit yeah. around with data live. This is actually what happens when we're when we're making apps. So we're looking at our um, ridge line here, and I again I should probably sort my states. So maybe if I just select a couple that we can look at. I've got a decreasing amount of cases over time. That's good to hear. I think is, is AL Alabama. So they're, they're all decreasing. That's good. Colorado never went up too much. I'm curious uh, if I don't have any data before 2021. So that'd be another thing for us to learn about our data set or the date ranges we have um, for each of those data sets. Cause we talked about maybe starting our data in March of 20. 20 when the yes. pandemic started. So maybe we could look at some vaccination data. Oh, actually I can just add that as an alternative in here. Yeah, that's great. And that's a great way to conserve real estate. Um, we, we won't get into that too much because I believe we've got more to talk about when it comes to reserving real estate and to maximizing your, your, uh, space on your sheet. Removing the nulls from state and date dimensions might also be helpful. I can do that. So you can see that it really picks up and I want to say maybe May, that's when that's when vaccination rates start to pick up and yeah, um, April, May. that lines like up pretty well with that date that we, we had said end of March is when they started, some States started to, to open up vaccinations. Jane, what do you think these dips are in the data? That's interesting. Cause it, I want to say maybe like, like holidays and people just weren't getting vaccinated. I don't know. Like, uh well this is it's aggregated right so it's it it's accumulated aggregated. over time yeah so it, it doesn't make sense uh did people just get rid of all of their vaccines in their body put them back in again <laughs> i 
I actually think this is just some data errors. We, we may okay. need to do some smoothing of our data set. Um, yeah, we might need to maybe match up our states better in our join. Um, there's there's probably a couple of reasons that we could be seeing that. So that would give us an indication that we need to, as we're exploring our data, we might need to go back to our data and, and um, clean it up a little bit so we can use it to, to build up this report. Yeah, um, I do find that exploring your data set is the best way to find data cleansing. Sometimes reading it on a table, there, it's just very difficult to find what you need to clean up. Yeah, the picture says a thousand words, you know. That's true. <laughs> cool. The Ridgeline plot says a thousand words. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we want to look at something like, um, are there more cases in populated states? Like maybe I love scatter plots, so maybe we can put up a scatter plot with population and cases. Do you think? Yeah, that would be great. Uh, we do have comments saying, "Can you isolate the bad data?" And I, I think I saw that U.S. was um, a, considered a state, so maybe that's all considered bad data. So yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I do think we could get rid of all the states titled U.S. and and maybe that's maybe all of the dips, um, all the data in the dips are actually going to just plain old US. Yeah. And I think, you know, our, our data is showing us that there's, there's definitely a, a lineup, you know, every, this date for every state, there's, there's some, a gap somewhere. So maybe I could go through my, my table and pick out one or two dates that I could take a look at. Do I just have blanks in that data or, um, that I can kind of smooth over or do I have, uh, maybe, you know, that mismatch that we were talking about, maybe the date format on that date is just wonky and I can remap it. Yes. Um, how do you smooth data? Do you, is there a tool that you use? Is there, is there anything specific that you use for data smoothing? No, um, not, not particularly. I think that, you know, statistically, like using statistical methods to do that would be the best approach um, if we were. Otherwise, um, you know, I think going back and understanding why that gap is there in the first place is really important because if I were to smooth this data, maybe I am hiding information from my audience that is valuable to them. So, um, you know, if this was like, let's go, you know, on a totally different topic here and say this was sensor data on my machine. And maybe at like midnight, I have a glitch. And every day at midnight, I have this weird dip where data doesn't get collected. Mm -hmm. If I were to smooth that, I wouldn't let my audience know that they've got this glitch happening. Um, so we have to be really careful to before we just like go ahead and make, make up, I'll call it makeup data, but to, to smooth our data we have to understand why it's there. And if that is, you know, valuable information for our audience, we don't want to hide it from them. Yeah, oh, uh, the idea of the seven day average, we see that so much in our COVID um, dashboards that are everywhere. Yeah, and I guess that's a, a kind of a bypass to, to data smoothing and making up data because yeah, data ethics is also a really important topic. And yeah. where do we draw the line and making up data? Yeah. And maybe making up data is the wrong word to use here. <laughs> yeah, not making, but just uh, filling filling it in. Yeah. Let's put in a scatter plot. And I know I want to look at state. And I said I want to see my population. And don't ask me why, but my, my field's name is July 2019 estimate. Okay. <laughs> don't ask any questions. We don't ask, ask questions. That's what the population <laughs> field is. <laughs> and I said vaccinations. So how about our people fully vaccinated? Maybe instead of that, I want to do max. So I know that, you know, I've got population data is not over time. My data sets just at one instance in time. What's the population of this state? So I do want to find maybe what's my most current or my maximum of my vaccinations. So I'm not aggregating my already aggregated data. So I've put in my max here to kind of see that. Um, so let's take a look at that. I've got my filter for those states that I chose on here. That's interesting. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so would you rather collect a uh, dashboard requirements and go off of it and build or just co-develop with the business uh, owner slash user? 
I think it's a really iterative process. Um, I don't know about you, Jane, but I think that as the BI developer, I want to do what I'm doing right now, just take time to explore the data, get to know it, um, and likely kind of have that iterative conversation with my uh, key st stakeholder as I um, you know, think about ways that I want to share information. And, and I love that we're kind of doing this with you so we can have that iterative, like, hey, Jane, I found this. Does that matter to you? Um, <laughs> and, and we can really kind of think about it together. Yeah, so it's almost like you, you'd like both. Like you would want to know kind of the requirements, but also while you're building out the dashboard, you know, after you know, getting to know your data, um, you want to talk about it more and yeah, ask any other questions that you might have. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you, yeah, let me ask the audience though, if you had to choose one, uh, what would you rather do? Okay, yeah. Andrew also agrees with us. Uh, requirements first and then reiterate with co-development. I also like having um, other BI developers also look at my dashboard um, because sometimes they'll see things that I or someone who's too close to the project and kind of knows the requirements too well uh, will actually overlook. Yeah. And so this is our scatter plot chain here of um, you know answering the question: Are there more cases in populated states? And, oh, I lost that. There we go. Thank you, undo button. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we have a great question. Do you also have age groups in the number of cases? It'd be interesting to see that cases in low age groups with, uh, with vaccination and uh, versus the high in uh, age groups without vaccination. That would so think be very interesting. We do not have that in this data set. Um, I don't know, Jane, would that be important to you to like maybe figure out what age group you fit in and maybe based on the activities you're doing, make assumptions about like what age groups you'd be around? Yeah, that'd be great to, we can try to hunt for that data for next time and see. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in seeing uh, my age group. I think that I would relate to that more and yeah, yeah, that'd be more applicable to my situation. Cool. We'll definitely take a look at that. So I love this as we're, we're asking questions. One of my favorite ways to do this data exploration is to literally have my title be the question that I'm asking and just kind of take a look at the data, see what it says, and not necessarily draw a conclusion right here and now. This is just an opportunity for me to explore and see what the data is offering me. Um, but you know, get to know it, get to know my data, see see what it has to say. And then, you know, obviously coming in with a more of a statistical approach as I start to build out my story, which we're gonna get to in kind of the coming weeks. But um, yeah, keep it, keeping this uh, theme going, Jane, are there any other questions that you wanna ask and build out? Um, well, we actually have a great comment. It would be great to have the ability to provide changes as the dashboard owner that would make, uh, that would like make us feel less nervous slash anxious about editing some of the dashboards. Hmm. I think that, yeah. Yeah, version one, they suggest edits or uh, build on a community sheet and number version two, more edits. Yeah, um, I don't remember, I don't know if they remember uh, when I worked with Simon, our, um, he's a designer and yeah, he says he likes to work on two different sheets, uh, mostly to see the improvements but um, I can also see working on two different sheets, one for collaboration and one for you know individual work. Uh, yeah. I like that you use the word collaboration because I was just gonna suggest, why don't you throw in the collaboration tool and get comments on your charts while you're trying to build it out. <laughs> yeah, we have, we, have our own, we have our own tool uh, in VizLib Collaboration and we have a tool called Teamwork where you can actually just make comments and you can, you can actually filter on something. And then when you make a comment, it automatically selects that filter. So you don't have to, you know, do the whole telephone with the email saying, hey, can you look at this filter? Sorry, which filter? And then it just kind of gets confusing and you're like, no, it's this date to this date. I'm like, you know, sometimes it can get a little, <laughs> the words can get misconstrued. So yeah, uh, VizLib collaboration teamwork is really helpful. Yep, that's what it looks like. And there's a little button on the bottom. 
we can just like start a conversation like and then you can also select a, a date range as well what is that is that nj new jersey i've never been there but that is east coast east coast just drive up <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this might be a neat way to do that iterative, collaborative design with um, with our key stakeholder and kind of take it out and or use it differently when you actually implement your dashboard. So Jane, I noticed we don't have too much time left. Do you want to kind of explore some of the other um, data exploration that I did? Uh, yeah, that would be great. And then can you also wrap up by giving a quick summary of what we talked about today, because I think we might have some new audiences and a quick wrap up would also be really helpful to them. Yeah, sure. So we've got a, a ridgeline plot in here helping us to just take a look at that profile of our cases and our um, vaccinations over time um, by each of our states. So we can kind of filter in and take a closer look at that. We also asked, you know, are there more cases in more populated states? So maybe looking for some correlations and trends. We might want to throw on a trend line here where we can analyze that a little bit better. Um, you know, as we think about this data, you know, Jane, we mentioned a little bit of using the population data to normalize this. So looking more apples to apples, California versus New Hampshire, where we've got such different populations, they're going to have drastically different raw number of cases or raw number of vaccinations. So taking a look at how that's normalized for that population. So looking at things in terms of percentages. Um, so I've put in um, does a percent of the population with the, with cases decrease with vaccination rate? So looking at our percent of population vaccinated against our percent of population with positive cases. So maybe I can start to see, are there any trends here or maybe any um, themes that we could start to pull for our story? What is that cake? I think pie. What is that pie? Yeah, that's a <laughs> lovely pie chart you have there, Emily. Are you like my pinwheel? I can spin yeah. it for you. <laughs> you know, I wanted to see which states have the most fast, fast food restaurants. Um, so I, I threw in a pie chart here of just the, the count of fast food restaurants. in a, in, by It's state. a little hard to read. Is it California or Texas that has more? So I did sort it to try to help this, okay. um, you know, pinwheel effect that we've got going <laughs> on. Um but I would say that using a pie chart here is probably not the best way to, <laughs> to share this information. So um, I think next week we should dive into how to actually tell a data story, how to choose the right visual for um, the data that we're trying to show. So maybe what's a more effective way of showing which state um, has, has the most fast food restaurants? I agree. We did not see that comment has come in and said, that's correct. <laughs> we, we did not see this. We'll just pretend this did not happen. There's got to be a better way. <laughs> there has to be a better way. Let's talk about that next week. Okay. But to wrap it up, I'll, I'll kind of recap what we talked about. We talked about um, just getting to know our audience. Who is our audience? Um, really getting clear on what it is that matters to them. Um, how we're going to present the information to them visually. Um, we then talked about our context. So knowing the context of our data is so important as we try to tell a story with that data. So, you know, where did that information come from? How is it collected? And, and how are we going to go um, make decisions off of it? Um, and then last week, we just talked about getting to know our data. So exploring it, throwing it, throwing it on different charts and, and seeing what's there. What does our data tell us without, um, you know, us having any impact or, or bias, I would say, in it. Just start to throw out the data, see what it says, um, and explore, find find errors in our data, find gaps, um, start to ask those questions. Say, hey, do I have that piece of information? And, and let me go research and find some more information to really bring my, my story to life. So um, yeah, that's, that's getting to know our audience, getting to know the context of our data and getting to know our data. So I'm excited to talk next week about um, telling the story of our data, getting to wow. that point. Yes. That's great. Thank you for this. This is part one of a multi-part series that we're doing called uh, Let Your Data Do the Talking. And uh, this is all part of VizLib's literacy um, 
theme, uh, data literacy theme. And uh, if you want to know more about data literacy, there's actually a guide that you can download. Uh, can we throw the link in the comments again so people can know where to access that? Yeah, um, you can download it. It's very helpful. Um, yeah, uh, please come back next week to uh, to help us fix this lovely pie chart. It's very colorful, but I, I think we could do that. I wouldn't call it a pie chart, yeah. I thought you'd be more mad at me calling it lovely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See everyone next week. All right. Cheers, Emily. Thanks for cheers. coming on. <laughs> to our orange. Yes. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. Bye.